All right, hello and welcome everybody to another sales chat. And this week we are joined by Frank uh, Cespedes. I got that right? You got that right, John. Actually, um, who is a senior lecturer in the Entrepreneurial Management Unit at Harvard Business School. Uh, he's also received his BA from City College, New York, uh, MS from MIT, PhD from Cornell University. Uh, he's developed and taught a variety of MBA and executive courses, uh, led strategic management marketing program for senior executives and leadership for CEOs, MBA program, research associated, associated at Harvard. He has been co-author and author of six books and many, many articles to the Harvard Business Review. So we're delighted to have Frank with us here today to talk about sales strategy. So again, welcome, Frank. Well, thank you, John, and uh, I'm equally delighted to be here with you. Yeah. And also joining us as usual is Marta Neumeister, who is in Vienna, Austria. And my name is John Golden, and I'm here in San Diego. Frank's in the Boston area today. And for those of you not familiar with this format, this is Sales Chat. It's a 30-minute rapid-fire format. We're focused on one, um, one subject, which today is strategy and sales. Uh, and we're just going to get straight into it. If you want to join in the, on Twitter, it's hashtag sales chat. So again, this is sales chat brought to you by sales pop online sales magazine and pipeliner CRM. Okay, Frank, let's just, let's just dive straight in and let's talk about sales strategy. So, uh, there's, there's always been this kind of, um, uh, thing about salespeople being very independent and independent thinkers and you know they come up with their own independent strategies and they do things their own way so how do you how do you align and reconcile a sales strategy with a bunch of independent thinkers well i mean you know as in most big business issues and this is a big one uh, there's no single answer to that question uh, most uh, business issues whether they're opportunities or challenges you know, have multiple factors uh, in play. Uh, but in this case, let's start with the data because um, uh, many people I have found uh, have an intuitive understanding of this, but they're still surprised by the magnitude of what we're talking about. Uh, US companies alone, this is United States companies, mm -hmm. spend over $900 billion annually, annually means every year, <laughs> on sales. Uh, now, what, what is in that figure? What's in that figure is the uh, salaries that we pay salespeople, the commissions, the bonuses, the travel and entertainment expenses, and the attributed back office uh, administrative overhead. Uh, just to put that figure in perspective, that is more than three times what U.S. companies spend on all advertising media, Super Bowl ads, everything. It's about uh, more than 20 times what they spend on all social uh, media. Uh, and um, it, it's an average of 10% of revenues across industries, but obviously it's often much more than 10% in many B2B businesses. Now, that's the numbers. Uh, and when I see a number like that, uh, I'm always reminded of what the um, the American author Mark Twain once said, if you're going to put a lot of eggs in one basket, it's a good idea to keep your eyes on that basket. Right. Now, if we look in that basket, what we see, and the data I'm about to cite has mm -hmm. been unfortunately very, very consistent for years. Less than 50% of employees in companies say they understand their company's strategy less than 50%, which means more than 50% are basically saying, I really don't have a clue. But here's the perverse part that's relevant to our topic today. If you cut the data, what you find is that the closer you get to the customer, in other words, when you look at the responses from uh, people in sales and service, the percentage of people who say, I don't understand my company strategy goes up. It doesn't, it doesn't go down, it goes up. Obviously, it's very, very difficult uh, to uh, implement something you don't understand. So one issue uh, with salespeople uh, is simply um, uh, communication. Another bit of uh, data, uh, again, uh, good research about this. On average, companies uh, achieve only about 50 to 60% 
of the financial performance that their sales forecasts and strategies promise, about 50 to 60%. Uh, now, I teach at a pretty good MBA program. Mm -hmm. If you want to understand why my students who go into private equity, investment mm -hmm. banking, venture capital, tend to be a cynical, hard-bitten lot, it's mm -hmm. in that data. They are constantly dealing with people who overpromise and underdeliver. deliver uh, So uh, another issue is um, overpromising and poor uh, forecasting. And then a third issue, and then, then I'll stop, John, but a third issue, and admittedly, I think uh, MBA programs have contributed to this confusion. Uh, and I think it's getting worse, and I think it's particularly a big issue out in your uh, chunk of the woods, uh, you know, uh, California, Silicon sure. Valley tech, but a very, very persistent confusion between strategy versus mission versus v vision versus values. All those things are important but they're not a strategy. A strategy is much more tangible than those other things. And many, many senior executives, especially tech founders, confuse the two. So again, those would be the top three things that I mention uh, around this topic. Yeah, and you're, you're, um, you're singing my song there, Frank, because um, I, I did something a little while ago um, back before I joined Pipeline. It was around this idea of the strategy company strategy and go to market and to your point is you have your sales and service people and say let's just take your sales people the closest interface you have in an organization to prospects and customers right and if they don't understand your strategy and can yep. articulate it then what's the alternative they're either making it up or they're inventing it so everybody's right. getting a different message about what your company's strategy is yep. um, so so how do you go about addressing that? Well, you know, the basic uh, idea behind my work, uh, my book, uh, is this. The most important thing about selling is the buyer, not the seller. Uh, and I start from a premise that I think is uh, pretty sound in just about any business I've ever had um, dealings with, and that is value in business is created or destroyed in the marketplace with customers. It's not created in meetings. It's not created in uh, PowerPoints uh, about strategy. It's either created or destroyed in the market in actual customer encounters with those frontline people that you uh, 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 just uh, alluded to. So you begin there. You always begin with the external not the internal. Mm -hmm. You begin with the market. The market includes the industry you compete in. Uh, the choices, if you have a strategy as opposed to you know, some abstract wish list, the choices inherent in your strategy about which customer segments we play in, which customer segments we don't play in. All of that is going to determine the buying processes and buying criteria that your salespeople encounter. And in turn, that determines the sales tasks. And by sales tasks, I mean the things that your people have to be good at to deal with customers and execute your company strategy, not some generic selling methodology. Then after that, all the issues are about doing one's best to make sure that actual selling behaviors actually align with those sales tasks. And when you cut through uh, the undergrowth, ultimately managers and sales leaders have three levers available to them. First and foremost, people. Right. We hire. Mm -hmm. What do we do with them once we hire them? How do we socialize them? How do we train them? How do we develop them? The second lever is what I call the control systems. Uh, what I mean by that is how we pay people. What are the metrics that we track? things like that. And then the third lever is what I call sales environment. But if one wants to use a word like culture, we're probably talking about the same thing. Um, what is or is not the uh, communication 
uh, within the sales organization between sales managers and reps, and equally important and getting more important in the world today, the communication or lack thereof between the sales function and other functions in the company. Mm -hmm. Those, I think, are the key issues and levers involved in actually trying to link strategy with sales behaviors. But notice my assumption. My assumption, again, is that the company has a coherent strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm about to say sounds so obvious, but after 30 years of working with lots of companies around the world, I don't shy away from saying it. It is tough to get sustained good things done in business without a strategy. It is. So you, you got to make sure you got one. Yeah, I know. I, I, I agree. And I, I used to have this quote, I think, from The Art of War, where it was like, um, uh, tactics without strategy is the noise before <clears throat> defeat or something. Anyway, there's a, there's a really good, uh, there's a really good saying. But my, but the point that I want to get back to here, and I think it's an incredibly important one is, yes, I totally agree that a lot of companies don't have a coherent strategy. In fact, at a couple of companies I ran, I used to get it to where we could have it on one page. And then I laminated yep. it, laminated it and sent it out to every single person in the company. And I said, put that on your workspace. And every day, if you can't relate what you're doing to what's on that one page, then you're doing something wrong. Yeah, no, and I, I think that's right. And I'd make two comments in response to that. Uh, one is, um, and, and, and again, uh, you can't see because of the headphones here, but um, uh, there's not much hair up here. Once upon a time, I look like Jimi Hendrix, but no longer. <laughs> But uh, one of the few virtues of going bald is experience. Now, I have probably, because of the research I've done, because of the company I ran for 12 years, I've probably been part of as many strategy and so-called strategic planning sessions mm -hmm. as anyone, certainly as many as anyone at Harvard Business School. And I can tell you, uh, despite all the talk about this, when you cut through the rhetoric, what most companies are saying when they use the word strategy is basically, let's pick a big number and go for it. And unfortunately, it's a bit more difficult than that. The second thing I would point to, and this is where I think your laminated card is important. Um, remember what I said earlier, the data uh, about uh, the less than 50% of people who uh, really don't have a clue what their company strategy is. Mm -hmm. Now, when you ask senior executives, why is this? Why are you doing such a bad job communicating what is obviously a core aspect of the business? By far, by far, the most common response you get is, well, you know, we don't want our competitors to know about mm -hmm. our strategy. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, step back and think about how bogus a response <laughs> yeah. that is. If, you know, if you're running a company, you got bigger problems than your competitors knowing what your strategy is if your own people don't know. So again, yeah. that laminate car, it sounds simple, but it's also effective. Yeah, and coming back to one other, and I agree totally, and then basically, and if your salespeople, et cetera, and your marketing is all uh, articulating your strategy, well then guess what? Your competitors know your strategy. But that's not a bad thing, right? As we as we just said, because at least it's coherent. Um, coming back to a thing you said, uh, okay. So there's the strategy, but then there is the implementation of it. And sales managers and sales executives obviously play a key part because of what you said earlier about, you know, if you're selecting one target market or one type of customer or another, then they're the ones who have to instill that discipline that when you choose something by definition you're unchoosing some other things right exactly and, that, and so talk a little bit about the role of the sales manager or the sales executive in really helping salespeople to stay focused on the strategy yeah uh, the first line sales manager is is a crucial position in any company that has a um a personal selling organization whether it's field selling or inside selling uh and the interesting thing about uh, sales managers well, two interesting things. One is, if you look at where at what they do in most companies, they actually can materially affect more than almost anyone else in the company, those levers that I talked about earlier. And secondly, they are the area of management where when you talk to our people, they're the ones they get the most complaints about. 
You know, so and so is not really a manager; he's still a salesperson, etc. Um, but essentially, I think the uh, the areas where sales managers can have the most impact um, are are the following. I, I'd cite three. One is, as always, you begin with people hiring. They're the ones who typically are most involved in hiring. Now, the data I'm about to cite has been true for over 60 years. This is cl as close to a fact in management as you are going to find. Uh, and when I cite it to executives, it's a little bit like the stages of grief. Their first response is, <laughs> I don't believe it. Then their second response is, well, I believe it about him and her, but not about me. Sure. Uh, and uh, their third response is very often ignore it. And the, the data is this, managers, not just in sales, but especially in sales, managers vastly overestimate their ability to judge somebody's actual performance on the job based on a few interviews. Again, the data here is overwhelming. The correlation between the evaluations people get in their interviews and their actual job performance is about 0.25. Now notice that's less than 50%. The implication is many companies, this is the data, don't shoot the messenger. The implication <laughs> is many companies would literally have been better off picking resumes at random for hiring than doing the interview. But that is the way it's done. What's the implication of that? Sales is a performance art. It is about behavior. What you want to do is not not interview. You want to do the interviews, but the interviews are at best a screening mechanism to do a whole series of behavioral assessments. And the interesting thing is that technology is allowing companies to do this should they choose to uh, uh, more accessibly and less expensively. That's the first thing. The second thing is what happens when the salesperson's hired. Uh, performance reviews. Uh, in my experience, and again, my experience with sales organizations at this point in my balding career is pretty good, but in my experience, performance reviews are by far the most underutilized lever that managers use to affect behavior, especially in sales. Sales managers are busy, and most of them treat performance reviews as sort of drive-by conversations about compensation and past performance, not really about review, development, coaching. Single best thing you can do to improve sales performance is to get your sales managers to take performance reviews seriously. And again, this is a trainable skill. This mm -hmm. is not metaphysics. There's just good off the shelf training. And then the third issue I would point to, and it's partly sales um, um, and then partly uh, a C-suite issue, compensation. Uh, when you look at how salespeople are paid around the world, give or take a few percentage points every year, about 70% of salespeople make their bonus, their incentive compensation is based on sales revenue. How much is sold independent of margin, profitability, cost to serve selling cycle. Now notice what the message is to salespeople when that's the plan. The message is any customer is a good customer. Yeah. And you said it very well earlier, without no, there is no strategy. So mm -hmm. you can see what happens very quickly, even if the company has a coherent strategy, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if that's how people are getting paid and as a result, behaving. So those would be the things I'd focus to, uh, I'd focus on initially in that area, John. Yeah, I, I, I love that. That's a, that's a really important point that you just brought up about the, the compensation, about all those other things that aren't brought into play, because um, I, I completely agree with that. And I've always, I've always found it one of the most interesting parts of when I've done strategy sessions with companies, my own companies with other companies, is when you start to talk about here's what we, you know, people go, here's what we want to do this year. And then you ask them that lovely question. Okay, well, what are some of the things that you're going to stop doing? Yeah. Uh, and then suddenly there's silence in the room and nobody can, and that turns out to be, it's easy to come up with new things to do, but it's a lot harder to come up with things that you're going to stop doing. 
Yeah. And I think if you look, you know, I, I, we can cite the names, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, St. Stephen, as we now say. Uh, but, you know, in an interview shortly before his untimely death, uh, Jobs was asked, um, you know, what have you learned? essentially. And, you know, he, he look back on his career. Here's somebody who was fired in front of the United States when he was 30 years old. He starts other companies. He comes back. I think one of the reasons we have such a, a affection uh, for that man is, uh, you know, if you're of my generation, you saw him grow uh, from essentially a kid into a true manager and leader over over time. But in that interview, Job said, I'm proudest of the things we did not do. Uh, mm -hmm. And you, you've got it exactly right. I mean, a, a strategy is choice. And choice means choices about what we are and are not doing. Mm -hmm. So tell me about what are some of the common mistakes that uh, the companies make when they try to align their strategies with sales? Well, I've, I've talked about some already in the sales area, right? Mm -hmm. Getting better at hiring as opposed to the cloning bias mm -hmm. that uh, dominates uh, hiring in the sales area. And by cloning bias, that's just academic jargon for saying, you know why I'm hiring you? Because I like you. You remind <laughs> me of me when I was young or, you know, hey, you went to Harvard. That's a good school. You know, that that's, that's cloning bias. Uh, compensation. Uh, and then uh, performance reviews. Those are issues I'd point to in sales. But there are also C-suite yeah. issues that are involved. Again, if we're going to link strategy and sales, uh, uh, strategy is something that includes sales but goes beyond sales. Uh, we've already talked about one. Make sure you have a strategy. Make sure you communicate it and get over this nonsense about, you know, we're worried about competitors. If competitors want to find out about your strategy, there are obviously very easy ways to do that. I can hire somebody, uh, uh, et cetera. That's number one. Number two is a big change, however, taking place at the senior levels of companies that, in my opinion, doesn't get enough uh, attention. Very good bit of research uh, done in my house, a colleague of mine at Harvard. And uh, what she uh, found is that if you look at C-suite, you understand that jargon, right? CEO, yeah. COO, mm -hmm. CMO, etc. Mm -hmm. If you look at the C-suite, uh, and she did this uh, research globally, if you look at the C-suite of companies around the world in the last 20 years, <clears throat> the number of people reporting to the CEO has doubled, right? Twice as many. Then if you ask yourself the question, well, who are these people? Where are they coming from? The reality is that very few of them are what you and I would call general managers right. responsible for profit and loss in a line of business. Mm -hmm. They're basically specialists. The CIO, the CMO, the CFO. 20 years ago, there were more COOs than CFOs mm -hmm. in Fortune 500 companies. Now, there's twice as many CFOs as, as COOs, etc. If you ask yourself, why is this happening? Uh, business is getting more complex. We are living through a data revolution. There is more specialization. Uh, ironically, businesses look a bit more like universities than, than vice versa right? Um, but notice what this means. It means the C-suite is increasingly siloed and more and more and more people who are part of those strategy discussions have never had any existential experience with sales. And again, value is created or destroyed. Any strategy is ultimately implemented with customers. So another issue uh, that's involved here and a big mistake is a failure to keep in touch. Uh, I'm always fond when I work with executives of uh, quoting a comment uh, that I read in a novel by John le Carre, you know, the British spy sure. novelist. Mm -hmm. And one of his characters in one of his novels um, says, a desk is a dangerous place from which to watch the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that should be tattooed on a prominent body part of every <laughs> senior executive. So that's another issue. We, we've got to look at both sides yeah. of this coin. 
So in your experience, um, can you give examples of some uh, companies that you've had experience with that have done this really well and, and what they have done to overcome this, this silo? Yeah. This um, let me, uh, uh, there are a number of uh, examples. Uh, although it is important to remember, and I think people forget this, you know, we use the phrase competitive advantage all the time in business. By definition, competitive advantage is something only a minority of companies have. So mm -hmm. when you all notice when you're seeking out examples, you're always looking at that minority, not the sure. majority. Mm -hmm. But I'd quickly cite um, two examples I cite in, you know, in the recent book I wrote on this mm -hmm. topic. One is a startup company. Uh, it's got a disguised name, but uh, basically it's a company that had a very typical trajectory for startups. They grew and then they reach what venture capital is called the Bermuda Triangle. Somehow growth stalls, you know, nobody knows what's going on. We cut costs, we do this, and things uh, continue to sputter. Now, the reason that happens, and this company is a good example, is that when you're young, um, you ignore everything you and I have been talking about on this podcast about strategy. Mm -hmm. Cash is king. It's yeah. like I tell my students, you know, MBA students always like to talk about the long term. And I always tell them in class, remember, if you in business, once you graduate, if you don't survive the short term, yeah. you don't have to worry about the long term, <laughs> right? And that's true of early stage ventures. So, you know, it doesn't matter. Any customer is a good customer. Notice what that does. It fragments product development. It fragments sales tasks. It increasingly generates expenses, et cetera. What this company did was, um, uh, and did it in a very good way, they took a look and said, well, who is our ideal customer? And after doing that analysis, it turned out to be very, very different than the uh, customers they'd been selling to and urging their salespeople to sell to for the previous two years. And once they made that analysis, everything else we talked about, who we hire, what metrics we look at, how we do performance reviews, all that changed. The other company I, I uh, like to uh, uh, cite in this area is a big established company, uh, Dow Corning. Uh, Dow Corning was a classic and very, very successful solutions, you know, full service solutions mm -hmm. provider for decades. But then along comes the internet, along comes um, lower cost competitors. And starting at the turn of this century, uh, Dow Corning is taking a beating. And again, it's like, as I said earlier, the stages of grief. What do you do in that situation? You cut costs, you do this, you do the next thing. But finally, they said, we've got a strategy issue here, not simply a sales issue. They looked closely at that, but they said, essentially, we've got two different customers. There's one set of customers that still is interested in and willing to pay for all those pre-sale application and post-sale services we provide. But then we have another set of customers that won't. We've got to reach them differently. And basically, we may not even need salespeople there. And that essentially became an e-commerce play. So I, I would cite those two companies at different ends of the, uh, the spectrum. Yeah, no, th those are great examples. <clears throat> I love that. And we're um, actually, Frank, uh, the, the half hour has flown by, which I thought it would, because whenever there's really fascinating content like this, it goes really fast. So here's one thing that we always like to round off with is ask you, when you get up every day, what, what is the one thing you do to set yourself up for success? What's your power tip? Um, let, me, um, uh, let me put it in a sales context. And uh, specifically, although, hey, I ran a business 12 years, had to meet payroll. That was a real job. What I'd now do for a living as a professor is, is not as tough as that. Uh, but I think one of the things people consistently underestimate in sales is the importance of persistence. Uh, and I, you know, I would say in answer to your question, John, what I tell my students in the final class, I say, remember when you graduate, no one pays as much attention to you as you do. Mm -hmm. And that should be both liberating and sobering. It's liberating because it says, you know, if I make a mistake, the world doesn't end. In fact, not that many people are going to remember it a, yeah. a week from now, let alone a year from now. And that's important in business because business is about learning because markets always change. But it should also be sobering. 
uh, you know, uh, uh, ultimately, uh, don't believe all this rhetoric you hear uh, in, um, in visionary statements. Ultimately, only you are responsible for your development, not others. And you got to be persistent in that as well. So, so that's the way I would uh, answer that question. Yeah. Now, be beautifully said, I, I, again, it's something I totally agree with that uh, when people talk about, even as you said, career development, it's like, you know, what are they going, what are they doing for career development for me? And you think, no, what, if, what am I doing for career development? For well, me? standing around and waiting for the company to help you is, in my opinion, not the best strategy. Exactly. Well, listen, Frank, this has been fascinating. If people want to learn more about you, how can they uh, contact you or find out more about you? Well, I mean, um, this book I mentioned uh, yeah. and our topic today, Aligning Strategy and Sales on Amazon. Um, there's, of course, the LinkedIn page. And uh, I do have a website, although I confess I'm not the best maintainer of, of websites, but it's, uh, you know, www.franksespedes.com. And thank you very much for asking, John. Yeah, and uh, we'll have uh, Frank's book up on the bookstore on uh, Sales Pop uh, as well. So if you're looking for the book, you'll be able to find it there as well as this uh, interview. So if you like this interview today, please make sure you share it with your friends. The recording will be up. I think this was fantastic, Frank. Uh, so much information. We could have gone on for probably another couple of hours. And well, we'll do it again. Story. We'll do it again. So, so right. thank you very much for today. Um, thanks again, Martha, for making sure everything runs smoothly. So um, we'll leave it there. That's another sales uh, a sales chat in the in the can. This is John Golden. Uh, I'm from Pipeliner CRM and Sales Pop Magazine. Thank you, everybody, for listening today. Thank you, John.